Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Studio podcast. I felt like there was something I was going to say there, and I don't know what it is, but it felt appropriate, and there it's gone. You could repeat Dave's really funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> it was. We stopped him in the middle of it. That always makes for a good joke. Well, it really heightens the punchline. Then you got to deliver like twice as much. And well, yeah, the punchline has the context is divorced from the punchline at that point. Like you, you wait a really long time. Right, and yeah, then that she went to had the a zoo. little more heavy lifting to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have just added dead babies. When in doubt, add dead babies or yeah. Hitler. Yeah, or Hitler. <laughs> wow. Or both. Can you imagine dead baby Hitler? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that meme exists. Um, I, like like a cross between like somebody has put a Hitler mustache on Baby Yoda for sure. That's happened already, <laughs> right? Oh, uh, today's on today's show, we're going to um, be talking about battling resistance. Um, and it was kind of funny. I don't know if anybody's seen the full cycle on this yet, but um, I clicked into the agenda and I was like, "What is the show about?" Like, I I, I don't know. <laughs> And so I posted it and I looked at it for a while and I posted a screenshot and I said, I said, it doesn't look like there's anything here or is it just me? And I added the, is it just me? Just because that's something you say to not sound like an asshole. Like, of course it wasn't me. <laughs> and then, and then I, I like, it's enough, you look fat lately, but is it just me? Or? Like, it's weird enough that I feel like somebody downloaded my photo and re-uploaded it using my account or something because then Neve's like, well, there's these bullet points right here. And it's, really clear like it's just but i think that my brain thought there's some kind of you know standard stuff at the bottom and something was missing at the top it's well you know what it starts with guests none and then the main topic is empty and then announcements is empty and links for the show is empty because there's blank spots there so i mean there's one body which admittedly is the most important body right i did i saw that but if you but if your eye skips over that one thing it, it looks like a template so Johnny missed one thing and then his brain was like yeah it was it's actually kind of an interesting illustration of of the things the brain does the fallibility of the brain I mean we've used that in the story in stories actually where it's like no people think that they're infallible but they all they remember well, the right, height of the burglar wrong uh, and yeah you know, Tony Robbins tells that story really well you know because Dave loves do you want to do your Tony Robbins, Robbins impression um I don't I don't okay. not right now <laughs> how about Gordon Ramsay <laughs> um no I'll skip that one too I'd rather do Tony how about Robbins. that lady at the baseball game sitting beside you how about Elmo <laughs> um I used to do a lot of Elmo actually I know um uh yeah Please so <laughs> um yeah I forgot my point so yeah. Tony Robbins tells that story really well oh about, something oh, about the right. salt right about you you're you're looking for the salt in the cabinet oh, yeah. you're positive you're like oh my god there's no salt in here. I've looked at every single, uh, everything in this. You're complaining cabinet. to your spouse about where is the salt? Where'd you put it? You're not it? just complaining. You're ranting. You're talking about the motherfucker who broke into your house and <laughs> stole the salt because it was right here a minute ago. And then they walk into the room and pull it right off the pantry and say, you mean this salt? And it's like, you know, giant and blue with someone holding an umbrella. Like, yeah, I, I've done that. Like, yeah it's no 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 I, i've been the one to find the salt <laughs> so i win oh of course it's never been the other way around no way. never not once <laughs> uh do you want to talk about um cookie macaroni <laughs> oh yeah what's the appropriate size pot for that Dave? <laughs> is it possible to cook macaroni and cheese in a too small pot i argue that it is possible and wise <laughs> so, yeah good times <laughs> not so, gonna bite on yeah, he's not. <laughs> we need a worse show ever for sure. <clears throat> so, anyone have something cool? No, no nothing cool. Nothing cool at all. Neither of you. No, the coronavirus is not cool. I'm sick of the coronavirus. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. I saw a pretty cool, like, indie vampire movie. Um, like a uh, streamer or like a theater. Movie. No, no, no! It was on. It was on. Um, on video. On. Oh, you've already on, seen it. Amazon. Heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't know the name. I don't remember the name. It was. <laughs> it was good though. <laughs> you did not come prepared for this segment. No, I didn't. I, I was. I, I, I'm going to talk about it in my newsletter this week, so I'll have to go get the name. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, that would be a good idea. And congratulations on writing a newsletter. Well, that's Ooh. three weeks in a row now, I think. And for we talked about reboots, we love that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, uh, am I supposed to call it something else? 
Um, no, 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 that was good. No, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't really have anything. So little email. <laughs> if you have two and Sean does his usual thing and I have nothing, I'm going to look much worse by comparison. Um, well, okay. So uh, I saw uh, two different documentaries. Um, the, the, uh, the second one I have to see the end of tonight. I just started it last night and then got sleepy. We paused it. But, they're, but it's already fascinating. Uh, I, I wonder, if Dave, if you've seen either one or both of these. So the first one is like, oh my God, it is just so, like, my DNA in this thing. The, the premise is there's these two twins, all right? Uh, it's, it's a documentary again. Both of these are narrative. So there's two, um, there's, there's two twin brothers, and they're 54 years old. And um, when they were 20 years old, one of the twins uh, got into a really bad car accident and lost his memory. And the documentary is called Tell Me Who I Am. Do, do you know this? Have you heard of this? No. Okay, so the premise is that f from the time they were 20, the brother just totally lied about everything like in their past, in their life, they lied about who he was because they had this really traumatic childhood and he didn't want his, uh, he didn't want his brother to know. And, and he was trying to like save him from the trauma that they had both gone so through. So available darkness. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, after 30 years, things are not adding up and he's asking more questions and the brother's getting more and more evasive. And so the documentary is made in like real time where they're each telling their side of the story and how, you know, I know my brother's keeping secrets and the other brother's like, I've been keeping these secrets for this reason. Mm. And, and then at the end of the documentary, you get to hear the story live as he tells his brother. And it's just, oh my God, dude, it is so emotional and just great it's storytelling. On Netflix? It's on Netflix. Yeah. And the other one is called The Voyeur, which I'm sure you've seen. Have you not seen this? No. He's got it on a loop. Is it about me? <laughs> <laughs> so it's about a dude who builds a, um, a, a, or he buys a hotel where he can make a secret area above the hotel. I heard he, about that one, yeah. Yeah, and he can just watch people. And um, one day, like, he watched a murder. And so I don't know what happens at the end of this, but it's, it's getting really, really good. So those are both, like, hour and a half simple documentaries that are just, like, really enjoyable with, you know, very human stories, which is why I like them. They're not like, there's a lot of really great expose type documentaries out right now, but just the, like the very human nature of, I have a secret, I've been lied to my whole time. And now they're sitting at a table across from each other, like getting real. Oh, that shit's good. So, so I'm, uh, I, I looked up the name of the movie. It's called The Transfiguration. And um, it's about a, a, a troubled teenager who in a basement in a, what's that in a basement who grows up in a basement <laughs> no he, Dave, he only comes down once a month no no he, he lives he lives in a an area like in like these gangsters are like pretty prevalent and kind of fuck with him and he meets this girl uh a teenage girl who like is being abused and she cuts and she's just in a bad place it's you could tell so it is about you you, you you could tell that they like uh, let the right one in. They even reference it uh, in the movie, which I thought was pretty good. I think Dave had this film custom made. <laughs> it, it's it like feels, all it, of his hot points. It feels like it. And the kid, uh, the the boy, um, he he believes he's a vampire. Um, and I, I don't want to say too much, but it's very it's done very straight uh in very it's probably the most believable vampire movie i've seen and uh, like it's about their friendship and he is uh like it opens up it opens the opening scene is somebody in a bathroom so yeah you know i wrote that uh, <laughs> it's a guy it's a guy pissing and he hears like noise coming like i could have written this <laughs> It does feel like a movie I would have written. Uh, the guy's pissing, and then he turned, He hears someone in the stall, and he looks down, and he sees two pairs of feet, so he thinks it's like two gay guys going at it, I guess. And then the camera goes into the stall, and you see this kid, and he's, he's, he's young. He might, I don't know how, he looks young. I don't know if he might be a little older. He's between 12 and 14. And you see him, and it looks like at first he's like kissing some dude, but then you see he's just sucking his blood he's out. Eating and the guy's, his face, not sucking his face. Yeah, yeah. Well, not eating it, but just sucking his blood, and the guy's dead. So he's he's going around and murdering people, and 
he he might be autistic i'm not sure there's something there's something a little off and disconnected about him uh probably trauma more than anything but it's just a it's it's a psychological vampire movie and i, I really enjoyed it it was uh, i knew nothing going into it it's just like one of the like i want to watch something just take my mind off shit and it was good so <laughs> see this is no fair because um you guys just i don't know you just go through a lot more stuff or something i'm like well i that's the only I, movie I saw this week. I, I started <laughs> Watchmen after everybody in the world, and uh, you guys have already talked about that. How and, are you well, doing it? I really like it. I haven't finished it yet, but it's like, um, I mean, that's that's you know, I watch one thing at a time, and so I don't really have anything cool. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm watching more now than I ever have before. Well, no, that's not true at all. I'm watching more now than I ever have since the children have been born. But that's also because, you know, like a lot, like a, a lot of time I spend with Haley is doing that. Um, Dave, because of you, we're watching Mr. Robot straight through, um, <laughs> which we're- Where are we're you now, at? <laughs> we're at that very, we'll, pro- we'll probably this weekend be done with season three and on to season four. Uh-huh. Um, uh, we're, I think we're on episode nine of season three and there's 10 episodes. And then, Who's watching you and your daughter? Just me and Haley, yeah. Um, Did she figure out the, the first twist? she did not she did not and um and she's good at that and she she did not and there's no way she could have figured out that the one twist at the end of two that's just like kind of amazing but you know i was looking for clues this time because i knew um i've seen the first two uh, two seasons already and then we're in virgin territory in season three before together like neither of us have seen it um, but yeah, she's, she really is just blown away by the storytelling in that show. And it's not like any other show at all. I, I showed a friend of mine, Mr. Robot, to get her to watch it. She figured it out in one episode. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's always so disappointing as the person who shows something off. You're all proud about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Like, no. what are you fucking stupid? You didn't know? <laughs> And it no. feels so inevitable because you're watching it with them and you already know and you're wait, like, wait, oh wait, man, wait, they're okay. going to get it. Okay, are you talking about the identity of Mr. Robot? Y- yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, she knew that. I'm talking about the identity of Darlene as the first big... I don't even think of that one as a twist because it is so obvious. I'm okay. thinking of the 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 Darlene. That moment... Um, you fuck it, it's in season one. I'm going to spoil a uh, spoiler for season one, so plug your ears if you don't want to hear this. <laughs> But when when he when Elliot tries to kiss Darlene and she pulls yeah. away and she's like, "Do you not remember who I am?" That <laughs> moment, uh, like it caught me. I didn't see it coming, and it's just an amazing moment when you're like, "Oh my God, they're they're brother." Of course, they're brother and sister, and it just makes everything make sense. And that's the beauty of the writing in that show. Is I'm that- surprised you'd be like, "Yeah, I remember." Why do you think I'm doing it? <laughs> We're okay. in Alabama now. <laughs> uh- <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there, there that went. <laughs> Alabama, love you guys. Actually, I like Alabama. Fucking New I Orleans. Think, is it, would you say it's your sweet home? <laughs> Louisiana. I think uh, that 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 show it it demands a lot of the viewer. Like it's basically asking you constantly to trust it. It's just like you trust it. I got you. You know, there's definitely um, a lot of that in Watchmen too, but it's wrapped up in nine episodes, and then you're done that you know i'm what 30 episodes into this and it's still like don't worry (laughs) we're going somewhere and it it pays off uh, i know i know i i have faith because uh the storytelling is so good i can't i can't wait to see what he does with battlestar yeah the ballsiest go ahead dave uh, it's the last season four or five i mean i watched it but i don't remember which one it was four okay all right so you're almost at the cool yeah yeah and also last point on our something cools um, Bonnie, uh, I saw you say, wow, that was amazing on uh, Tell Me Who I Am. And yeah, I thought about you while watching it last night. I was like, oh, Bonnie would totally get <clears throat> the shit out of this. It's, yeah, it's, it's all the stuff we're always talking about, about secrets and, you know, telling the truth kind of uncorks everything. But these characters were actually saying those words out loud. <laughs> like, I can't go on because I don't know who I am. So like the things that we're building as character backstory we're just like front story in this. It was just kind of amazing. And, and there's a comment, something off, aka he's a vampire. Now, I, I, I think he's also autistic because of the way he relates to people. 
uh, you'd have to watch the movie. Uh, it, it's never stated, and that's what I like about it. It's very subtle. Nothing is clearly stated in the movie. So anyway, go on, Johnny. What were you going to say? Oh, well, I'm, it's a little out of the loop at this point, but I was just going to say that the best example that I personally have seen of that, like, trust me thing was in uh, Mulholland Drive. Oh, yeah. Um, because when you realize what's actually going on. I haven't watched on, the end. Don't spoil it. I won't, I won't spoil it. Wait, because you David Lynch movies are really it's, hard to spoil. I, mean, I haven't watched. I like saw that part of it and I never went back. Like if I catch a movie in the middle, I don't watch it. And oh, like, okay. now I can. That's not a movie you pause and come back to a few years later. No, no, well, <laughs> I yeah. just give up. <laughs> well, it just let's just say that the setup of the movie requires like once, you fig- once you've seen the whole movie, you're like, oh, wow, it's a good thing I trusted them on that it's a good thing i hung in there so it's like upstream um, color different kind of <laughs> trust it's a little more that. accessible than upstream color <laughs> which <laughs> upstream color is just rough <laughs> um okay so let's move into the topic today we're talking about battling resistance um and now there weren't ta- talking points here originally as i discussed um <laughs> they snuck them in and uploaded them to your account so what what does resistance look like? I mean, let's 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 describe it with the enemy first, right? Well, you love the War of Art, so you should describe it. <laughs> well, he personifies it. So in the War of Art, um, Stephen Pressfield just basically like the resistance, like it is an actual enemy, like an enemy army that you're battling. And do they you have know, a cool like um, wage logo, war like the Star Wars Rebel Alliance? Uh, maybe it's a guy and a lazy boy. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so, you know, it's all about the war of art is all about like the ways that the resistance crops up and tries to distract your mind and not let you finish your creative work and all that stuff. But um, but what does it look like specifically for for each of us? Um, For me, it's it's a little like a virus, um, like in that it changes what each time I get infected, like it's not the same each time, but it is constant. It's not like I ever don't have resistance. I'm pretty good at fighting it. Um, because I'll, I know different ways to, to battle it, but it's not like it's always there. So for example, um, I, I do hit, I do hit resistance, um, pretty much every day <laughs> when writing at some point, even when I'm really, really into the project, there's just other things that I want to do. Like I want to go watch altered carbon because <laughs> I'm an open loop in my head and, you know, it's fun to be told a story instead of having to make one up. Uh, but fortunately, I always owe things to people. So that keeps me going. Um, I don't like letting people down. It's one of the reasons I collaborate with as many people as I do is because I have more reasons to work, um, you know, and that keeps me productive. Um, I also know when I'm not productive, I don't feel good at all. Like later, it's like I, I feel bad or guilty for using my time poorly. So I don't want to feel that. And I know you know, future Sean's going to be pissed at me. (laughs) So I don't do that. But like, uh, I'm also always looking for ways to kind of keep my schedule fresh, because that keeps resistance away too. Because I think just the way my personality is, um, if I get the if I have the same routine over and over and over, um, then I rebel against it. I'm like, this is school. I hate this. Why am I having to sit in my chair all this time? But on the other hand, I can't be too loose because my personality really doesn't do well with there not being any rules at all because I'll just go to my own chaos and I'll watch whatever or I'll start going down rabbit holes. and Cat videos on YouTube? No, I don't ever do that. But like I'll start. Okay. So for example, I really like the making up the story part of the story process, right? And I could easily lose two weeks just going down rabbit holes and uh, a really good example is Dead City. Um, oh, know, God, yeah. When, when I had time on that, you know, because, like, I just had a lot of time. I don't remember, like, d- d- Johnny needed the outline, like, I don't know, six weeks later. And, like, I, I took a lot of time just researching things that I didn't need to know at all. Like, I didn't need to know them at all. They were things I knew Johnny would handle perfectly fine. But it was fun to read all about how, um, like I was reading actual, um, what's well, funny now with the coronavirus, not funny, but it's interesting. I was actually thinking about this yesterday, Johnny, I was watching, hmm. uh, it was a Joe Rogan thing. 
Uh, it's a really good link. If I yeah, no, I've actually seen that. I yeah. know what you're going to say. Me too. Yeah. yeah and, and they were, they were talking about that stuff and I was like, wow, this is real similar to some of the stuff that Johnny and I were talking about while framing out dead city, because uh, a lot of the stuff I read ahead of time was about, you know, like the way the military would respond and the way we would have to like tamp down the virus as it was spreading. Um, so anyway, uh, like I really do love those rabbit holes, but I, I can't afford them. You know, like if I all of a sudden start just reading for sh three weeks, <laughs> like not getting outlines or drafts done, that's a problem. But it is what I want to do. And it's a really easy thing to rationalize because, oh, I need that information. It'll make the outline better. And you're going that direction anyway. That's going to be, this is going to be my job. You know, you can never fool yourself into believing watching cat videos is going to be your job someday. Right. So, so I can make a lot of excuses for like the way I spend my time, even if it's quote unquote responsible, but like, if I don't actually accomplish anything and I got to tell people like, Oh, I, I didn't finish that thing for you. And I kind of know how I spent my time then, then that's not good. But I, so I do need some basic borders. So for example, my very basic border is that I work between five thirty in the morning and noon every day. Like, unless I have some reason to <clears throat> like there's travel or an event or something with, the family or there's some reason that's that's when I work I you know I wake up early and you know I work on and off not totally because I'll take a walk or something go jump on the trampoline but you know I, I do take little breaks but that is my maker time now within that how do I spend the maker time between editing things that need to be edited writing outlining whatever <laughs> that changes but one recent change I made and it was in direct response to feeling more resistance I was working in 90 minute blocks and we had a podcast, I don't know, a few weeks ago where we were talking about kind of what works and what doesn't work for us. And <clears throat> we were talking about Pomodoro. And I went back to trying 30 minute blocks. Uh, 25, it seems like a waste of time to me. Like it's so easy to just tack on an extra five minutes and make it a half hour. So I make it 30 minutes. Um, and that's actually working really well for me. I, I, I finished a book yesterday. Um, so that's worked for all three of us. Yeah, rolled mm -hmm. right into the next one. So <clears throat> it is now that the, there is a danger with that one. And it's that I take longer than five minutes and like unplug too, too hard. And then I'm facing that resistance. It's like, it's no different than the resistance, resistance I would face in a 90 minute block, except I have it more often. So I have, you know, more battles to fight. But I found that if I really can keep it to sub five minutes and just go right back in, then it's perfect. It's kind of like a, a breather and I'm, I'm, I'm back into well, What are you flow. doing in those five minute stretches? Well, it depends. And that's part of it. What, what, what works the very, very best is um, just walking around, disconnected. Yeah. going on the, on the treadmill, not checking Slack or email right. or, or, you know, reading screen rant or anything that's going to like pull me into a different activity and reset my brain, yeah. but just letting me just kind of take a deep breath, even if it's physically or emotionally, leaving the room and jumping on the trampoline, coming back in, got new blood flow, I can get right back to it. But like <clears throat> this, this happens all the time. And, you know, it just, it is what it is. Like Cindy will come home from yoga. And, you know, if I'm in between breaks and I'm leaving the office, like I don't like a world where I don't say hi to her, <laughs> right? So I interact with her and then it's very easy for me to, um, for 10 minutes to pass. And, and then I have a lot of resistance because I'd rather go hang out with my wife than write. And so, you know, like I have to be smart about that. And she's, she's really good. She's like, look, you know, I, I don't want to break your flow. So like I'll do my own thing and don't worry about it. But, you know, it's like, I know Johnny feels this too. Like when he hears his children playing. On the, you know, oh yeah. It's the worst. It's like, I mean, it, it doesn't, this doesn't mean the same thing to you because you differ, but I don't work on the weekends. So it feels like I'm working on the weekends when my kids are home and I'm working. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it, for resistance for me is really knowing not just myself overall, but my particular temperature at that moment, um, kind of what is on my plate. Um, it's one of the reasons I like to have a lot of deadlines kind of stacked up. Uh, like right now, I don't have something that's just waiting for me to write. And that's not super good for my momentum because if I don't have something that's just waiting for me, I feel like, oh, I, it, my time doesn't matter as much. And it's not that every moment needs to matter. It's that when my moments don't matter, I don't treat them with as much respect. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dave? What's it look like for you? Cat videos? 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I have external and internal. Um, I, and I suppose they're both internal to a sense, but there's like the external is stuff that I don't know that I don't know. Like a lot of times, like if I'm doing Are you talking within a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, like uh, you know, the story I'm writing now, like uh, something to do with the district attorney's office. So I need to find that out. But then I'll find out something else that, okay, well that ooh, that other thing I did doesn't make sense now. So I got to fix that. And then I and then I become well. How many other things don't I know? And all of a sudden I'm like kind of fucking fumbling in the dark. And that that's difficult. And I know I need I need to do it. I can't ask you to do it because that's you can be like, what the fuck? I'm not. <laughs> I I want to I want to edit. I don't want to research. And um. And there's things that like I know that you're not familiar with, so I gotta figure that shit out. And that is um, that's one thing, but it sort of creeps into the other. And the other is like I fucking suck, and I and, like the self doubt and yeah. All of that, and that's. I mean, not that you fucking suck, but I understand that doubt. It's the internal chatter, and then there's you know, like when I fall behind on deadlines, like I I know deadlines work for you, and and deadlines, in theory, work for me. But when they're too tight, I'm too stressed out. When I'm too stressed out, I can't fucking think because I'm just thinking about the thing I got to do. And the more I think about the thing I can't do, I have performance anxiety and fuck it up. So. That's the internal, and that's that's the difficult one that for me to battle. And uh, a lot of times, you know, internal is way harder, right? Yeah, and I, I got to get out of my head, and that requires getting out of the office. But that's also time not writing. So if I get out of the office and I go for a walk, it helps me. And but it's also like, so it, it's it's difficult, and some some projects are easier than others. But it's it's not anything that. Uh, that I've completely mastered um, yet. So, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, it's probably, I mean, I tend to, it's it's a little like what Sean was describing where you, you get the, the edge of something like, oh, I could do this for just five minutes or something mm-hmm. like that. And then I'll kind of, the resistance builds a little bit and I don't want to go back. Um, the Pomodoro has really helped because the, of course, you know, the idea is I can focus and do anything for 25 minutes if I know I'm getting a break and that yeah. does work for me. Um, but um, left to my own devices, I'll rationalize it away, especially when I'm doing, I mean, I guess this should go without saying when something is difficult or when I don't want to be doing it. So like the project I'm doing right now is just eating my face and I've been working on it forever and I just hate it. And so ironically, the more resistance, you know, that comes up is going to just make me take it longer and be resistant for a longer period of time. So what do you, how do you fight? Like what's your best weapon? Um, it's usually just realizing that I'm being a piece of shit and shame, shame. So like, <laughs> shame is surprisingly effective. Yeah. Shame is because usually, uh, let me put it this way. If I have a day where I'm, I never totally fool myself. So when I think when I have resistance and you think, well, you're fooling yourself and I mean, maybe I'm fooling myself and I'm just not realizing those times, but I always get to the end. I'm like, don't fucking lie. Like, obviously that was douchebaggery that you just did there. Don't pretend that that was rash, you know, that that was good behavior. And then the ends of those days feel immensely unsatisfying. Like I just, I feel bad about myself and that, that helps me. Yeah, that, that absolutely helps me too, because it's not easy to feel like shit. <laughs> like that's just it. One thing I know that, that uh, helps too is keeping like a, a daily diary of just like how you spent your day and having to actually write it out. Well, I, you know, when you have to articulate to yourself why you didn't get stuff done, it's way harder to do. So taking the time to do that, it, it may seem masturbatory to tell yourself how you spent your day. A documentation of my failures.com. <laughs> well, it's like keeping a, um, a, a food journal, right? Like, doesn't that keep you honest? If you have to keep, if you have to write down everything that you eat, you eat better. If you have to, you know, journal, you know, how much exercise you're getting, you exercise more. So sometimes when I am fighting a lot more resistance, I just, like, I, cause I don't journal my days every day, but I find that 
when I do, I, you know, I usually am doing a better job. And when I start to, to step off or I feel more resistance, I know that it's more important that I, you know, track. Um, where do you think the line is on dis- because w- there's giving in and then there's times when you're able to kind of battle through and what makes the difference in terms of whether you're able to, cause there's always a temptation first. Like it's, that's what resistance is. It's not like a car crashes and you're skewed in one direction. Another branch of reality, Dave. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's a, you have a period of time where you're tempted and you can either give in or not. So what makes the difference? Are you asking me or Dave? I'm asking any, either of you, but I can't be asking myself. So I'm asking <laughs> one of you. Guys. That's the way this works. Um, I don't know. I don't know what makes the difference. Um, I know, I know what's harder for me to fight is when, um, when I don't have the borders, which like, I, and I get why uh, deadlines suck for Dave as hard as they do. Like, I totally understand that. But for me, I always know that just getting through something will gives me the chance to get through it again. So, um, for example, I was having a few doubts on the last thing that I was writing. And doubts always, like, they just always, always, always um, make me go slower. Because <laughs> it's yeah. what Dave was saying earlier. You can't write, th- <clears throat> I mean, you can force yourself through it. But, like it's just hard. It's, it's hard when you don't feel the story or when you don't ha- have clarity on where it's going. Um, and th- the disconnect I was having in what I was writing this time was that <clears throat> there, it, it was a sci-fi world. This actually happens in a lot of sci-fi worlds when I write the first draft. I don't believe it as much. And so like, I don't really know how things work. And it was one of those, um, this, this book was a little Black Mary and there's a whole like, uh, like I forget what it's called in Ready Player One, but the Orion, I don't know. No, that's our torture device in the beam. Um, whatever it is, you know, the virtual world that's basically better than the real world in every possible way. And you could buy your way on and have credits and all of that. And I'm not real positive of the way the world works. And so I'm just bullshitting my way through a lot of it. <laughs> and um, by the time I get to the end, I have a much clearer idea Um, but I'm also, I know that I can end the story and feel pretty good about where it is. The disconnect that I have is knowing how much what I've already written disagrees with where I am. And so, I mean, nuts. yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a disconnect. I'm like, okay, I know like probably the first third of this book doesn't really have the same tone that I need here at the end. And if I fixate on that, then I get inertia. Like that's, I can't think that way so I like do you to... feel like oh there's too much to fix so i'm not going to do anything or what <laughs> i have no experience with this <laughs> <laughs> yes that's how i feel dave is that i don't want to i just don't want to do it like when when it's not that it's hard because it is it's also not fun <laughs> and like that sometimes you don't know where to start like it's kind of like cleaning a giant messy living room or something like there's just so much you're like oh fuck it <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like uh, it's it's overwhelm. You know, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed when you don't know where the story is going. And overwhelm is a very, very uh, direct route to resistance, right? <clears throat> when you're feeling overwhelmed, like you just want to take a step back and, you know, not do it at all. Um, you know, like th- this this book that you guys will all get to enjoy at some point, but is eating Johnny's face right now. You know, there was a point, I don't know, three weeks ago, a month ago, where he's like, can we just like put it aside for a few months and come back to it? And even as he is asking, you can hear it in his voice that he knew. Like, no, I just needed, I knew that there were no answers when I talked to Sean. I was just like, it's, I needed some sort of a pep talk or for you to make it all better or something like that. But there was, I knew there was no solution. Well, it, it's just, it's hard when you don't want to do something. Well, it, point, Sean didn't finish the thought, but I was basically like, can we just, set, oh no, you did finish the thought. Yeah, no, it, it was, it, it was yeah. basically, can we set it aside? Because that's the easy thing. Like, 
oh, maybe I'll want to do it later. But the odds of you actually wanting to do it more than you want to do it now after being disconnected from it are pretty non-existent. Yeah, I, I didn't go down with one punch though, guys. I've been, I've had my hands held behind my back being punched by this book for like six months. So eventually I was going to fall down. Yeah, it's, it, it, has <laughs> been, it has been rough, but... But it's overwhelming. It's exactly what you guys were just talking about. It's, it's, it's a really long book and the sorts of things that are changing have echoes throughout everything else in the book. There's no quick fixes. It's not fixing grammar or changing somebody's name or rewriting a scene or something. It's, it's conceptual things that the whole book is about it. It's really hard. And I've, I think I'm, I'm not halfway through yet and it's been like a couple months or something in the revision. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's, it feels like, no matter how hard you work, you don't get very far. <laughs> so it's real, it's real defeating. And, and, you know, Johnny's the same as me in that way, I think. Well, probably most artists, when you're rolling, you want to roll more. Like you feel, rolling, rolling, rolling. Yeah, momentum breeds momentum. Um, so it's, it, you feel starving when you don't have that. And, and it is easier to get overwhelmed. Um, you know, mm. but I, I, knew, I knew that I was going to have to... Um, I was going to have rewrites and they were actually heavier than I expected. Um, I, I thought like I'd get a, a pretty good way. Th this book was in my head, you know, <laughs> better <laughs> than it, it was. Um, but the, the first chapter needed a complete rewrite <laughs> and um, there's been heavy editing in the first few chapters. I know at some point I'm going to just start rolling because that's when I found it, but <laughs> there's like a, um, not just the way the, the science or the, the world itself works, but like, um, uh, Dave, you'll, you'll like this. There's basically, it's a, a mother and son um, self-help gurus. Um, they have a business and- And the, then the, the baby dies and then they go take a shit. <laughs> Piss, <laughs> and, it's shit. On the, and it's on the cover of Architectural monster. Digest. The son, <laughs> the son, the son takes, um, uh, the son basically knows his mom is selling snake oil. And so there's like, you know, he's basically going off to this digital playground to get away from her. <clears throat> and so um, uh, the way that their actual program worked, right? And then I realized that um, this other character is sick and dying and we didn't really ever give the sickness a name or a character and that kind of needed its own personality. So like this is stuff you just never know in the draft, right? Like you have to figure it out. And I think that that giving myself permission to look, even if this is the worst thing ever, I'm still going to get to, you know, rewrite it. Um, and, which is actually how I'm spending all next week. I'm tidying up all the, I've written three books so far this year and they all need tidying up before I pass them forward. And that's what I'm doing next. One of them is in okay shape, which is this one. One of them I think is in great shape. Um, and one of them is in pretty bad shape. And it's the one I started, um, the year with and that book could have been called resistance like it was just i had i had more resistance writing that book than anything in a long long time what do you think you can predict when you're gonna have resistance and if you can predict it are there things you can do upstream to try to meet it ahead of time uh for me yeah i, I can smell it coming which is or or i i hit it early which is why i moved to 30 minute blocks for example i i could feel it getting harder to conquer those 90 minute blocks. So um, I pulled back and that's been great. Um, I think it's paying attention. It's easier to do if you measure. It's easier to do if you, you know, are recording your days, keeping a time journal, stuff like that. What about you, Dave? Um, I don't know. Sometimes it surprises me because like I'll feel confident about a story going in and then surprise. <laughs> yeah. uh, and other times I know, like if it's something like way out of my wheelhouse or something, I, I feel I don't really know or have a good grasp on. I, I know it's probably going to be a rocky ride, at least to start with. So, yeah, I, I have a good idea when it's going to happen and it does happen. I try not to have the mindset, oh, this is going to suck. I'm going to fuck it up. And I try to get out of that, you know, mindset in advance because I don't want to pollute myself. Um, but I don't know when, like I said, there's times I'm confident, like, oh, I'm going to bang the fuck out of this story. It's got, we're done. And, oh, uh, yeah, I didn't realize, or 
or it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Like it's missing like the emotional connection I was looking for. Okay, now, wait, wait, that's wait. what happened on the last book. Yeah. So this isn't a trap, <laughs> but how are you on the latest thing? Because you were really confident going into this one. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Uh, it's not great yet. Cause you know, I got other shit going on, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident more than I was on the last one. So. And how, how deep are you into the story and at what point, or is there, is there not even a consistent point? Um, I, I mean, we've been writing together for a decade now and I actually don't know the answer to this question. Is there a consistent point in the story where you start to really feel the push and pull? Like, do you know in act one or is it not until you're done like coasting into the climax where you're like, oh, this isn't working? Uh, usually somewhere in act two, I start to realize it's falling apart. Sometimes in act one, if I'm just having difficulty getting started and then I'll, and then I will jump ahead and I'll be like, okay, well, I'm going to come back to these scenes because I'm clearly not ready for that yet. And then I'll go back to, to fix them. And then I'll say, oh, fuck this. No, I'm not. No. So it could, it's either, it's one of the first two acts. Uh, it's not often in the last act. Uh, I mean, there's times where I've had difficulties with the last act, but it's usually in one of the first two. But, well, I think that's actually kind of funny because I'm just realizing that when I get stuck, when I have resistance on a story, I think I'm a little more fucked than you because <laughs> I can't skip ahead. Like there's nothing else I can do. Um, when I say can't, I'm sure I could maybe train myself to do it or something, but naturally I go from A to Z. Even if the story is told out of order, I go from A to Z because the reader journey is always from A to Z. Like the reader is always read. So I, I just, I find it really hard, hard to do that. Um, well, I'll leave a paragraph saying, you know, like beats or, you know, I mean, we already have beats, but if I'm changing them or whatever, I will, you know, this is supposed to happen. So I'm not like, it's more subtle than that for me. It's more like, um, Sean, do you know the sort of thing that I'm talking about? It's like um, oh, if a yeah, character knows right something, yes, if a character knows something that was in that missing chapter, there's a flavor to the way that they would think about it with themselves and stuff that, that I need to understand. Yeah, it's something, I mean, you could definitely learn to do it a different way, but- I no think it would really change my it. voice, right? Yeah. Like I'm- that may add a, a certain flavor to my writing that is different than other people's writing who are able to skip around. Yeah, I get um, what you're saying. Um, like the conversations people have and stuff, and there might be a conversation that you write in advance uh, that doesn't have the same context or whatever if you go back and do right. something earlier. That fuck. Yeah, I, I get that. And I've had, I've had situations where that did happen uh, so I, I can see the danger there, but there's times I'm just, I can't fucking write it for whatever reason. So yeah, that can go. make stories with multiple timelines really hard for me because I'm trying to juggle consistencies within timelines and consistencies across the whole story, which is a little weird. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, I can, my resistance can come up like you described, Dave, where it does surprise me. Um, usually I can see it coming a little bit and, um, but if I know, like sometimes I'll finish a chapter and I know that the next chapter is like, oh, fuck, I got to do that chapter now. And usually just for want of a better term, I have to punch my way through it. It's almost like, um, uh, I mean, I don't literally do this, but think of like, do you remember that scene in the office where Dwight has his psych up routine before he goes and sells or something? <laughs> yeah, he's like, ha, ha, ha. Right. <laughs> so I almost feel like I have to just mentally be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kill this tomorrow. And, and. If it's really stubborn, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't kill it at all. But then I'm like, yeah, I'll kill it tomorrow. And eventually it's just like brute force. Um, but one of the things I tried with this current project, and it's interesting, I've only tried it for a day, but I, the plan was to do it for a longer period of time was I thought I could bake in incentives and punishments. Um, so what I tried to do was I said that, you know, for my given number of Pomodoros that I was going to spend on the, the project that was frustrating me, um, I could... Like if I, if I got, if every Pomodoro was like good and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't having resistance and giving into resistance and being an asshole about it, which again, I'm, I'm pretty honest about that. I'll be like, oh dude, there's no way that was a shitty day. But if I could conclude that it was a good day, then the next day I let myself have a few of the Pomodoros at the beginning for another project, which originally I thought it might be, I was like, well, it could be this project. And then I was like, no, no, no. It makes logical sense that that would be like the next Maurice novel that I have to write anyway. 
And so, you know, I brainstormed it and I actually, I used two days, but then the, the, by the time I got to the third day and I could have done it again, I was like, well, I'm traveling. So I'll just use all the days for this one. And then I got a little momentum, you know, like I got through that and I was, so the next day I said that I'll, I'll just, I'll just hit it again. And I actually haven't gone back to it, but the idea there was, but maybe that's like some of its value. Maybe it was like, oh, okay. I realized that I don't need that carrot, but that was something that. But it's nice sometimes just to have an out or like know that it's the freedom thing. And we have different ways of expressing it, but freedom is so important to both of us. Like it it is a driver and how we define freedom is different. And like the degree to which we seek it is different, but it is like the core thing that we both need. Yeah. So we have a question. Is there ever an appropriate time to listen to resistance? I think yeah, I think so. To resistance, like why is it there and what is it trying to tell me? Um, but to, to Johnny's point is, be honest about it. So like, <clears throat> Johnny's dealing with resistance works because he knows how to be honest with himself. Like, you can build in rewards and punishments if you are actually honest w- with your assessment at the end of the day. But if you're like, okay, well I'm gonna <laughs> have a handful of M and M's if I, you know. Um, hit 10 blocks, you know, 10 Pomodoros today. And then you get to the end of the day and you're like, well, I only had six Pomodoros, but I did try my best. I deserve those m and And I deserve those m and <laughs> Well, then you're really fucking up with like yourself because you're not, you're actually not going to achieve any of the things that you are hoping to achieve because you've trained yourself that six is good enough and that your word doesn't matter. If you start like not fulfilling for yourself, that's why I think self-imposed deadlines are actually more important to me because I, like that's the relationship that I need the most, the one with myself. If I can't trust myself to follow through with my own promises, then like I just don't have any faith that my promises mean anything to anybody else. That's good. Uh, the other question was, how about moving to another project for a break, uh, working on multiple projects at a time, or is that just another way to progress? I feel like you have to know yourself. So the that was actually kind of what i was proposing to sean but again with the self honesty like i i knew what i was saying i knew that that was a terrible idea um as far as like abandoning it and coming back but i think it it depends on the project because there are projects i could leave and come back and that might be the right choice and it depends on the 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 writer um you know some there some people could probably totally pull that off some could not so you actually don't know this yet, Sean, but um, I think you'll totally agree with it, is I can't, so this story um, has flashbacks and the flashbacks are important to sort of context for the larger story. And when I wrote the draft, it just, the flashbacks didn't go all the way through the book, they kind of stopped. And so we were like, well, we need to have those, like they were consistent, they were a structural element within the story. And um, as I'm revising, I'm remembering that and I'm like, I, mercy, I can't do it. I can't do it. So I left you an assignment to sort of audit the existing flashbacks. Let me know if there are other things that need to be in there, if they make sense, if they're consistent, but also make me a punch list and, and just very short beats for new flashbacks that you think I need because I can't, I'm calling mercy on those. Like I can't vent new flashbacks and try and weave in hints and seeding throughout all of them on this pass. But if I hand it to Sean and then because it's going to take him time, I get a break from this project. Going back to do specific flashbacks, flashbacks are modular enough that they should just slot in. I shouldn't right. need to do all uh, of the contextual yeah, stuff. Yeah, that actually does make sense where that doesn't have to be as linear as something before. But it'll right. make the book even longer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I, I, I think... Uh, sh- I think Stephen King like, you know, worked or did work on a few stories. And if one got away from me, go to another one. Uh, well, that's me, what keeps me sane for sure. For, for me working on another project, I, I can't manage more than one story at a time in my head. Um, if I would say if there's something else you can do, like the, like sometimes drawing helps me sometimes because uh, it's not using the same muscles or whatever it's not using the same bandwidth as writing so if i draw something for a little bit that sometimes helps me get back into writing because i'm doing something different uh 
which, you know, it's just for me, it's not even for anything, but it's just a break. And when I'm drawing, I can usually think, uh, draw, like a lot of times, like during meetings or something, I'm doodling and drawing and that actually helps me take in the information. It's like, there's a part of my brain working when I'm drawing that's thinking in a way that mm -hmm. doesn't think when I'm actually fucking writing because I'm, I'm analyzing too much of it. So it's kind of the same when you're walking, like you're, mm -hmm. you're able to think more freely. So if, I would say if there's some project you can do that helps rather than holds back the writing, then yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I think I that's agree. great advice. Uh, yeah, I can't work on multi. I can't go to, no, I can sometimes go to another project, but it totally depends. This one would be a huge mistake, but we've done that in the past, especially between drafts. So like unique to Sean's and my collaborative relationship or obviously collaborative relationships very much like it, um, I, we trade off. And so when I'm done with something, even if I know that I have even more, that creates a natural break. And so I am divorced from it for a while between drafts if I, if I ever have to go back on one. Um, but I could see doing like short stories or something, but usually it's best that I just keep hammering through something. I would say more often than not. Would you agree, Sean, that that's sort yeah, of my, for, my for thing? Yeah, for sure. No and I, would, I did want to add one more thing on the, um, is there ever a good time to listen to resistance? And I think that Again, this is highly, highly individual. But for me, um, I know that I will, there's a few ways that I could look at this, but if I'm halfway through my writing day and it's been pretty shitty so far, I can keep insisting that I got this out and then I'm like, dude, I still have two or three hours left. I really don't want to be an asshole and go do something else. That's a lot of time. I'll, I'll get something done. It'll be better than nothing. But honestly, sometimes nothing is better because the worst thing for me is, so let's say I have another two hours and I still fuck around and I get 300 words and then I, I feel doubly stupid because not only did I do nothing, but now I wasted a bunch of time. I didn't even get anything good out of it. So to me, knowing to like when to listen to resistance in that particular way is good, but sometimes just your schedule, like you're being unreasonable with yourself and it's not really resistance. <coughs> sometimes... <clears throat> it suggests that maybe you're going in the wrong direction. Um, you know, this project that we have right now, there was a lot of resistance that caused us to shift course, a lot of resistance that caused us to start over, a lot of resistance that, that we had to go through to keep going. And I actually don't know the difference between them, but maybe that's just experiential. Do you, th do you think that this is, um, without a doubt, the most resistance you've ever faced on a project? And do you think that you will ever have this much again, if so? Uh, I think it's the hardest project I've had and therefore, and it's hard in a very specific way. So like um, Pretty Killer was hard, but it was hard in a way that was much more, um, I don't know, this is tedious. I get, that's what it is. This is tedious and tedium absolutely kills me. So when it, working out story problems is a level above tedium. I do not do well with just little tiny details and adjusting things. So yeah, there's a ton of resistance right now. And because it's been the most tedious, it's probably the most resistance. Um, as to whether we can avoid it again, well, I mean, this is a really unique project. And I think that there are circumstances under which a different project we honestly might have abandoned and just said, you know what, it's not working. Yeah, I think, well, because the post-production once we finally got wrapped, it's almost like the post-production is still like three books worth of time or so. Right. So we could have like mathematically just for us, creatively and emotionally and mathematically, we could have made the argument this and project is, is really not worth it. Let's just move on. But because we have somebody else involved and, you know, a year's worth of promises, we, we don't have that option. We we. And a lot of sunk costs that if we can pull them out, we won't have to lose, which, you know, that's the question. But it's also, I think this is worth saying is as much as I've kind of bitched about this book, I, I think, I believe, I mean, I'm sick of it right now, but, but <laughs> I think that if I can distance myself at all, I think it's going to be an, an amazing book. It's I really, really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I really do. And actually when I read it through, because I wrote the first draft and we had thrown away a draft in the middle and had a ton of problems with it. That was called the Dave cut. That was not, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I read it through before I started the edit. So it was first draft throw away, first draft to completion, 
read it through and then start the edit. And in that read through, I was pleasantly surprised with how good it was, even though all the facts were messed up. And so I think it'll be really amazing when it's done, but, but, oh my God, I don't like to have to work this hard for it. Do you, <laughs> do you, do you ever feel that resistance is something that is futile? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. It, it like I'm imagining having this conversation with my dad who built houses for a living. Like he'd be like, "Yeah, fuck yours." <laughs> like, Dad, have you ever felt resistance building houses? He'd be like, "Yeah, I just fucking went out and did it." Uh, and, and it feels kind of, uh, I don't know, stupid. But at the same time, it, it's very much a head thing. But you need your head to write a good story. So yes. yeah, it, I mean, I, I, cause I used to make the argument, I don't believe in writer's block. And I, I remember making the snide comment about like, why is there no plumber's block? Right. Yeah. But I think that it's, I do think it's different and I've matured a, a little more as a writer and had some of these experiences. And I, it's like, if you put a gun to somebody's head and said, don't be afraid. Okay. Yeah. Good luck. Like it's not <laughs> something you can just do. If you'd said to Dave, okay, don't worry about your decoy wallet. Like that's not something Dave's capable of doing. So I think I do now. think it's a little different. You know, when your head's messed up, it, it is, you can't just turn it off. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and since we, you know, Sean and I both used to say we don't believe in writer's block and we both had really hard stories in the past two years. So officially all three of us, I mean, there are circumstances where I think anybody gets, gets humbled. Sean, do you now believe in it? No, I've still never had writer's block. It's still like resistance. It's resistance. But don't you think that's semantic? Don't you think a lot of people say writer's block when they mean resistance and vice versa? Well, yes, but for me, I've never let it stop me. Like I'll have a lot of resistance, but then I'll just go ahead and plow through my shitty draft and know that I have a harder job waiting on the other end. I, I never let I never let a wall stand in front of me where I'm not writing or producing. Right. Well, you, I, but you have had resistance. You just haven't given into it. Fully. Yes, I, but yeah. I have resistance all the time. It's really a spectrum. So like, I mean, there are some times I'm just ready. Like I hit the keyboard and boom, I'm going. But a lot of times like I need to warm up and then, you know, and I warm up by like reading headlines and like, you know, and I'm not even connected to what I'm reading necessarily. It's just a matter of like, you know, I, I want to- Reading wanna... news headlines? Yeah, yeah. Like I'll read new, you know, Apple oh, that news. that just makes me more curious to read more news. <laughs> it just makes me depressed. That's a rabbit hole I go down. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I don't get, I don't get too, too lost there. But it's like I need something to, just kind of like stimulate me in the morning because. Um, that was a joke there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, I, I do think I, I know, I know people that have said they've had writer's block where they just didn't know what the fuck to write, like. You know, I sit down and I want to write a story, but I don't know what to do. And I think that's a different kind of writer's block. And I've fortunately never had that one. I don't know. Yeah, see, that just feels like a spectrum to me, too. I feel like there's like, I mean, there's always a way to figure out what to write. It just depends on sort of where you are at the time or if you're a novice writer and you you have a different conception of the way that ideas are formed for you and your unique preference. I could Yeah. See. And they might have a, 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 yeah. a doubt about, you know, whether their idea is any good or something that hasn't been done or so they might be right. comparing their ideas to all the other ideas and just giving up. So I get yeah. that. <laughs> I think it just depends. I think there's a way to deal with just about anything. Um, but sometimes maybe the, the nuclear option is, is an option. So all right. Um, well, Sean raised so suicide. His desk. You're saying <laughs> <laughs> Sean raised his desk, so that means the show's over. I guess he's. he's I, like, I actually have a four o'clock call. He's standing up to get out of here, but doing it very politely by staying on the air. All right, <laughs> raising his turn desk. off the lights. <laughs> Dave right, just well, dropped out of our meeting yesterday. <laughs> it was like my internet went out. Fuck you. And he goes, "It takes <laughs> too long to reboot." And Joel says. But the meetings are an hour. No, no, it was a half hour in because I remember because I remember looking like if I get back, I might be for the last five minutes. If yeah. that, so. it was fun. It was a good one. All um, right, all right, peace out, yo. All right, see you later, guys. Thanks for listening to Story Studio Podcast. We will see you next time. Adios.